Well, my name is Phil Roselier, as you know. Um, I'm 70 now. Uh, I grew up in the north of England and I've been in Australia since 77. So I'm a bit more than half Australian now. Um, though those entities are not fixed, I discover. If you go back, everybody thinks you're Australian. Here, everybody thinks you're English. And you can probably pick from my accent that I'm not fully acculturated. So, I mean, I think that's part of me, that I do maintain some distance between myself and the environment, for better or for worse. And uh, so there's probably some so psychological thing going on there, you know, in maintaining that gap. And some, some of us are always foreigners, you know, wherever we are. How did you travel to Australia? By plane, uh, those were the days of, you know, mass tourism and uh, uh, they'd figured out that they could fill the jumbos if the prices were low enough and uh, so the days of getting a whole row of seats to yourself where you could sleep the journey away had gone, that was sort of the 60s, by the 70s um, you were packed in like sardines. We were just travelling. Uh, we. My girlfriend and I had grown up in England, we'd both been at London University, that's where we met. Uh, but we'd spent time in Canada, and I'd had a job in America too by that stage. Um, and we were just coming to Australia because it was a bit of Anglo-Saxony we hadn't seen. So we didn't intend to stay, and uh, we came to Melbourne because she got a job here. She was in medicine, and she got a job at what was then Tange, the uh, Preston and Northcote Hospital. Otherwise, I mean, if she got a job in Sydney, we would have gone to Sydney, but that's where she was offered a place. So we came here and um, really being feckless, we were, you know, we were in our, what was that? I was in my late 20s. So we weren't planning ahead or anything. We were just kind of following our noses the way you do at that age, traveling. And um, but she got a job, so we had to find somewhere to live. I think the first 12 months in Melbourne, we lived in every suburb. From We lived in the city, in Toorak, in Heidelberg. And eventually we bought a house in Ivanhoe, because it was cheaper to buy than to rent, we found. And uh, that house I stayed in for the next 30 years. So it was easy to get in and not so easy to get out. <laughs> yeah, so I lived there all that time um, through two relationships and um, eventually I moved out to King Lake. That was 10 years ago. How do you, what, what drew you to King Lake? Um, I don't like the heat, so... Um, one thing about living in Ivanhoe was that uh, on those very hot January, February days, I found it intolerable. By that stage, we had a two-story house. I extended the house, and uh, my uh, um, study was at the front upstairs, and it was just very hot in the summer. So King Lake was one of the places I used to drive to, you know, on, when a day got too much. Like about one o'clock, you'd gone. Like you'd be, sit, be sitting there in your undies, trying to type, and uh, you'd go, oh, "I've had enough. I've got to get to some fresh air." And King Lake, being that much higher, you know, was that much cooler, and so it was kind of a bit of a bolt hole for me throughout those years. And um, <clears throat> so when that second relationship broke down. I, I had my 10 year old son with me and one thought was we'll go to the country, it's the nearest bit of country to where we were living in Ivanhoe and he will have a, you know, a healthy childhood, he'll climb up trees and ride horses and grow up to be you know, a young man with good values and all that, that was kind of the vague thinking. Uh, but of course he took one look at King Lake and hated it and said, uh, you know, where's my laptop? And uh, he just wanted to get back to the city. So that didn't work out. And the other thing was that we moved just two months before the fires came.
came through. We moved in December um, 2008 and the fires were in February. So, and that destroyed, the fires destroyed a lot of the amenity of the neighbourhood. I mean, everybody was very brave immediately afterwards and there was a lot of talk about how we would rebuild bigger and better and all that. But the truth, that you don't do that. The truth is that um, the fires were devastating. And so it, it, I've been there for a decade now and in some ways it's kind of been a, an aftermath of the fires. But that's life. life. You don't always get the cards in your hand that you think you deserve. What, what did you do for work? Uh, well, I did my PhD at Melbourne. I did a, a, My BA was at London and then I went to Cambridge and then I got a scholarship to go to Canada and did an MA there. Same here in Melbourne. When Nilofer started work, I had to find something to occupy my time, so I thought, oh, well, I'll do um, you know, doctoral research, which I did. Um, and what, so what um, I wrote on Australian poetry because um, um, I perhaps should have mentioned that I think of myself as a writer first and foremost, always have and still do, even though you know you fill your life with activities which are not uh, directly writerly. Uh, you, as a matter of necessity, you know, you have to make a living. So um, when I when I uh, completed my doctorate, I got a job at the University of California. So I went to live in America for several years. Uh, but my family were here. By then we had two small children. And I was com commuting sort of on a three-monthly basis across the Pacific, which was a bit nuts in a way. So I'd do a quarter there, which would be 10 or 12 weeks, and then come here for a month's holiday kind of thing, and a long break during the summer, you know, the academic vacation. And, um, I mean, in some ways that was very nice for me because I spent half my life being a fancy-free bachelor and, uh, you know, doing whatever I wanted to do in terms of work and travel and so on. Uh, but it, But there was always an underlying heartache with that um, because my uh, two little boys were very young and um, I was missing out on all that. And also, uh, you know, I grew up in a quite, um, in a provincial, puritanical, conservative environment and fatherhood meant something to me. And so there was a good deal of guilt attached to that uh, separation. The, 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 the thinking had been, Nerf and I had talked about it, and by then she had decided she didn't like Australia. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And there was humming and hawing, and then I got this offer in America. So the initial thought was that I would go, I had to go and take up the appointment, and I would prepare pay for the family to come over. Um, so I, I spent some time doing that in my first month there. Uh, but then uh, she said that she didn't want to live in America. And there was a bit of a history to that. She's, she's Indian. And um, when I had previously worked in the States, in Iowa, um, she was going to come over for a holiday. She was at that stage working in a London hospital in Guy's, at Guy's in London, and she was going to come over for two or three months while I finished the year in America. But she was turned down for a visa. Um, and I think she felt that the grounds were racial, and they may very well have been. But I think, actually, the more sophisticated picture is that the the medical association in America was keeping the numbers down. They were determined that they weren't going to get, you know, a huge flood of Indian doctors. And uh, so that was why she was knocked back. But I think that sort of um, a little bit of poison entered her bloodstream at that point. And by a decade later, she'd had time to think that through a bit and had decided that California, after all, was not for her. So at that stage, I said, well, where then? Um, 
you know, the central project in my mind being to reunite and, you know, we would work together and raise the children together. And she said England. So I then spent the next year, she wanted to go back to England. So I spent the next year organising things in England. I mean, I actually went over and looked at houses and chose a car and inquired about schools and all that. And then uh, when I came back for the next long vacation, she said, well, she didn't really want to do that either. So I don't know whether it was sort of getting through to me by that stage that she decided that she wanted to separate. Um, but after four years in California, I gave up the job. I said, I'm not going back. And at that point, Nertha said, OK, well, I'm going to Sydney. And she um, arranged, she'd been offered postgraduate um, work in Sydney, so she shut off and I had the children for that year. And uh, But that was the beginning of the end. And uh, we separated in 86, I think it was. I went through the family court, which was a disturbing experience. Uh, but that's the way, I mean, what I have discovered, Patrick, is that you can go through life putting one foot in front of the other in what you think is a reasonable way, being decent, but still, you know, you can end up in a cul-de-sac or, or tumble over or, you know, it doesn't necessarily work out the way you, you think it should. So, yeah. <clears throat> And so your 10 years in King Lake, have you, um, you know, how have you found the, the community and the lifestyle living out there? Well, I moved out with great optimism and hope and um, I'm, you know, a sort of, um, you know, I'm a quietist. So the idea, I've got five acres out there and a little cottage kind of set back from everything. Um, but I made a mistake. I didn't research the house properly. I, 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 this, there was a lot of property available. Nobody could sell anything at that stage, 2008. And um, um, <clears throat> so I looked at several houses and that was the prettiest one. I mean, just the site. It's, it's on a hillside with a wood and some paddock and it's just very pretty birds all around. And I thought, okay, and it's sort of well away from the main road. I thought, this is for me. I hadn't researched it properly, and um, I had thought that being right next to the National Forest or the State Forest um, means seclusion and, you know, uh, pretty nature. Uh, in fact, at the weekend, all the hoons ride their bikes out from Melbourne <laughs> to the State Forest, which, you know, is full of bike tracks, and they just, they come down my street. So, so, um, I'm exaggerating slightly, but that sets, that's really, um, it sort of points to the central error I think I made in moving out. King Lake is not really... Although it's, it's quite pretty, you know, and I do like the coolness. It's not the rustic paradise you might imagine. I think that for one thing, it's kind of Melbourne, the, the population is Melbourne overspill. My um, conclusion is that there are lots of people living at the end of dirt roads up in King Lake who couldn't really manage Melbourne all that well. And they've gone to get away from their neighbours and are a bit grouchy. <laughs> now I may be I may be completely wrong about that, but you know, I have had and some some people are very nice, of course, everywhere. Uh, I mean there's a sort of exaggerated friendliness which took me by surprise um, at first. Uh, because I thought I'm going to live with the hillbillies now, I'll be a hillbilly and that's fine, nobody will bother me for the rest of my life. Uh, only to find that people often have very bourgeois tastes, you know, they think you should um, speak as if you were in, um, you know, an American sitcom and be terribly sensitive about this, that and the other thing. 
so so it was a cultural uh, you know experience for me there was a lot of learning and I don't claim I've uh, really resolved all that I'm a solitary person and my response has been to become more solitary and I don't think I don't think that's the proper approach the best approach if I were doing it all again would be to be uh, frightfully, permanently, totally friendly and I think that's the way to get through in an environment like that and a lot of the friendliness is genuine you know I mean people are brought up in the country those who are locals to like other people and to think that people are good and to see the best in them and that is that becomes over time their personality by the time they're adults and that of course is a good thing a great thing and I wish you know I'd responded to that properly but with my sort of urban mentality by this stage there was skepticism you know and doubt and um, sort of lots of double takes on everything and I probably did not make the best of it yeah but there we are. Yeah. I mean, I was also working out of my uh, life experience, which had not always been uh, uh, delightful. So. But to stay for 10 years, there must be things that you found good. good well, like. yeah, I like, I mean, when it is quiet, I love the quiet. Um, five days out of seven, it's silent. It's absolutely silent and um, I'm hypersensitive to noise as to other things and so this will illustrate the point. There was one day I'm sitting at my desk and I can hear this gudunk, gudunk, gudunk and I'm going somebody's brought a pile driver into the street. What the heck are they doing? I bet they're going to build an industrial facility right opposite my house. Wait till I find them I'll give them a piece of mine so I'm looking all around and going to the windows and looking at the front door here and there and I can't see anything but I can still hear this gudunk, gudunk, gudunk. and after a couple of minutes I realized it was my heartbeat <laughs> <laughs> so that's um so there I mean what sensitiveness is kind of verging on the crazy isn't it at that point so you know that's a separate topic which I won't go into but um, you know I've always been an utterly rational and stable person but I think um, if you don't choose your circumstances effectively you can you know move affect your mental well-being so yeah um, moving from Ivanhoe to King Lake was a huge huge upheaval so that's partly the answer to your question why are you still there I have a library of 6,000 or so books and the idea of moving them is too much when I moved out to King Lake they sat in the shed piled up on top of one another deteriorating it's not perfectly waterproof for a whole year before I got round to shelving them and uh, that was a very dispiriting experience and you know your energy does diminish when you're 20 or 30 that's nothing you know that's something you get over on a, a Saturday morning you know you just do it and it's gone and you and you quickly adjust but at 70 it's a different thing you know there's uh, a huge dislocation so, um, I mean, if the bulldozer did come up the drive, I would start to pack, you know. Or if my neighbour did act on his threat and give me a smack on the side of the head, I would then move. Uh, but otherwise, I just, you know. I live in my writing, and that's how I plod on through day to day. Well, I started out as a poet, that's what I wanted to be as a young man. In my lifetime, poetry has virtually disappeared as, um, you know, a prominent activity. 
uh, that in itself is interesting. You know, occasionally I'll say to friends who are poets, well, you know, nobody reads poems anymore, and they uh, offer a kind of rather stubborn rejoinder, like, you know, well, it's, the, it's the highest linguistic form, and um, if people don't get it, that's their tough, you know, sort of thing. And um, I can see that, but... Um, it is a way of making your life pointless, isn't it, to be engaged fully in an activity which nobody's interested in. Uh, so I, 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 um, in the 80s or so, I moved on to fiction. I was an editor in those days, a literary editor, and passionate about poetry. But about 1986, I, uh, well, I didn't have any sort of mental crisis or anything like that. But I think I just made um, a practical decision. The people I'm dealing with are not really um, the sophisticated, um, deep, learned types that um, I always imagined um, writers to be. Um, so I think this is not right. I'm going to finish this life. And uh, I'd published a book of poems by then, but part of my change of heart was I decided I wasn't, I was never going to publish again. That um, I, I was sort of cheesed off by the superficiality of the literary, you know, the careerism, that element, you know, the book trade. That's how I frame it. Like there's writing, there's li literary creating, like being a painter or being a composer. But then there's the book trade, which is the marketing and career side. That's something completely different, and I have no interest in that at all. And having worked as an editor, you know, I'd sometimes been the target of sort of really silly advances. I, I remember a Sydney poet telling me once, you know, he was very frustrated, he said. Uh, he'd been trying and trying and trying for years to get his work into Helix, which was the magazine I was running and whatever he sent he just got a knock back and he was quite a successful poet he thought and quite good and what was going on he wanted to know why was his work being rejected and I don't know if I said anything to that I, I mean the answer was obvious that I get lots of poems and some I think are worth going in and some I think are not and unfortunately yours so far have fallen into the second category. So he goes, well, look, uh, my parents have a house in Melbourne and I'm coming down weekend after next. They have a lovely swimming pool and my dad has a terrific wine cellar. Why don't you come over on Sunday afternoon and we'll have a bit of a swim and chat about things? And, uh, well, I just, uh, I, as I say, I'm a provincial working class lad and I just thought that was a bit repellent and that's the kind of behavior you know you need to deal with and which you take on board if you're living in London and you New York and um, are hell-bent on a full you know a high-powered literary career that is just par for the course you know you you gobble that up that's a, a daily and weekly thing um, I have no appetite for that at all. Not because I'm morally pure, but I think because of my background. You know, I um, I hate careerism. Uh, my my parents were at the bottom of the social pyramid, and I'm proud of my background. And I have a lot of respect for people who have nothing, and who struggle. And I think I think putting up with minimal conditions is, is you know, that's sort of a respectable way to spend your life. So I don't admire people who are clambering over one another's faces to get to the top of the barrel. That's what I mean to say about that. Are we running out of time? Well, we've got about five, five minutes. Oh, OK. Yeah. Right, right, right. Right. So, um, so that's kind of a bit of a story of my life. You know, there's this leaf, and then you turn over the leaf, and there's this empty leaf, or, you know, or this, you know, this sort of counter instinctive leaf where, um, you know, I, um, I am ambitious in, in ways that matter. Like I want 
to sort out what I think about life and I want to write it down in the most cogent possible way and my sort of foolish eccentric notion is that the week before I die I publish the 20 books that are on my computer and before anybody can say but but I've read your book book but I've gone <laughs> and that to me would be a perfect ending but of course that's probably pie in the sky and at this stage I do worry a little bit because I go if if I trip over the cat tomorrow morning and fall on my head and they find me three months later, you know, having been eaten by the cat, probably, or half eaten, um, they'll come and clear the house and some bright spark will look at my computer and go, oh, this is five years old, this is no good, and just chuck it in the skip and there goes your life's work. I mean, that is sort of a possibility. And so I do, I do start to think of kind of end of life disposition and, you know, probably making arrangements for, you know, literary executor and things like that, whatever the legal requirements are, because I would, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work and I would like to leave that behind as a mark of my having actually passed over the planet, you know, albeit in, you know, I don't have any illusions about myself as a, you know, a kind of um, a, a genius or anything like that. And that, and by the way, we don't, I don't think we should be thinking about writing in that way anymore. It's, I think of it more as a cooperative endeavour. We're all here, we're all living in this society, we can all see defects and we're all trying to make improvements. And here is my view. This is what I think about it. Now I know 98% of you are going to disagree and I'm sad about that. That's unfortunate. But in the meantime, this is what I think. So that in part is the answer to your earlier question. I started as a poet and a fiction writer. Nowadays I write mainly about, um, you know, it's social analysis. It's about our living together and certain aspects of that. <clears throat> And I have a contrarian view, so I'm, uh, my work is not going to be liked, um, maybe in a hundred years time if it's still around and anybody looks at it, but at the moment I, I um, develop my views as a contradiction of what most people think. So most, most people think that everybody wants to come and live in Australia because it's paradise in the South Seas. I go, I doubt that. I don't think that's probably the case. You know, it has many sort of attractive features, but it also is hopeless in some respects. It's still, Australia is still a very provincial place, a long way from anywhere, and sort of, you know, three to five years behind in terms of developing its thinking on this and that. And, um, you know, it isn't, it is not like living in London or Paris or Berlin or and so on. So, um, you know, that self-congratulation, which is part of the Australian psyche, is unattractive to me, that constant sort of giving yourself a reference. Mm -hmm. um, I think I heard something on the radio this morning about Wix, the racehorse, and some some pommy bookmaker or, or race commentator has doubted that Wix is much good at all because all it's ever raced again is other Australian horses, which, as everybody knows, you know, are sort of second-rate convict horses. And so, you know, they couldn't resist the bait to that. So we got kind of a 10-minute spiel on that. That's the kind of thing that, that's what provincialism amounts to. I mean, you can't imagine anybody in um, New York getting hyper-excited about that sort of criticism. <coughs> mm, so yeah, we're going to have to wrap up here. Actually. Sure. And but thank, just maybe thank just you. quickly what you sort of, your thoughts <coughs> on what the future might hold for this area and for yourself. For, for this area in particular? Yeah. Well, they're building it up like crazy. And um, in, I mean, in some ways, that's a, that seems terrific. This library, for instance, which has arrived since I did, I think is a wonderful development. 
and I'm really impressed by you know the the um, the atmosphere here and the ethos and um, uh, it's uh, the the way for instance that it's tackled digitalization I mean I mean t digitalization is often a w obviously a wonderful thing but in some ways it's a disaster you know because it's it's introduced all this distance to, between people and it's also made criminal behavior quite acceptable as we all know you know the big companies are exploiting the internet like crazy to squeeze money out of us all um, this library it seemed to me took on the mission of educating Whittlesea and the Whittlesea area about how to use the devices as they call them and that's I think that's wonderful without any kind of pretension or side or you know it was just kind of a practical thing and so especially for people of my age you know who I've always used my computer as a word processor at the university but um, but 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 I have no interest in the innards of the machines so to get to be getting free advice from people who know what they're talking about is a big thing so that's that's terrific in some ways you know there's there's a the poet Auden has a phrase about raw towns that we believe and die in raw towns that we believe and die in and sometimes I think of Whittlesea like that <laughs> But of course, it's now suburbia, isn't it? It's now uh, being swallowed up by the Melbourne fringe and will become something different. What will it become? Who knows? Will it become a Box Hill, you know, a Doncaster? All those suburbs have their different personalities. And we can't say what Whittlesea will be because it hasn't happened yet. Look at Mill Park. I mean, what do you think about Mill Park? Do you want to go and live in... Mill Park. I mean, it has some wonderful aspects, doesn't it? All those broad crescents with the three and four bedroom, two bathroom houses and the double car garages. That's wonderful, isn't it? But does anybody talk to anybody in Mill Park? I don't know. Mm. I mean, it's a genuine question. I'm not saying I have an attitude on it. I just wonder. What will Whittlesea become? I like some of these little outer Melbourne towns, like Healesville, I think, is a terrific town. I quite like Yay. Yarra Glen um, used to have some fantastic vistas, but now they've started building stuff. You know, like you'd look at the pub from across the race course and you'd think, that is a fantastic Victorian uh, townscape view. And then they built something in the way. I think they built um, some brick flats or something, so... Mm. I, that's life, isn't it? That's progress. It is indeed.